Welcome to church. I'm Joshua. I'm the creative director here at Calvary. And I'm Carter, the worship and tech director here. We're so excited that you could join us from wherever you're watching from. If this is your first time joining us, we'd love to get to know you and answer any questions you might have. Simply text HELLO to 587-323-1199 and we'll reply right back. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy the service. The changes brought by COVID-19 have been difficult. Our lives changed overnight as everything shut down. We were forced to deal with isolation in a way we've never experienced. Suddenly, in the midst of the darkness, God showed up, like he always does. Turning fear into faith, quarantine into connecting, and downtime into precious time. Relationships were strengthened unexpectedly. And another thing changed. People all over the world, including our friends, neighbors, coworkers, and families, became more open than ever before to hearing the gospel of hope. The pandemic shook us, but it did not crush us. We shared good times and bad times virtually. We realized what is truly important in this world, each other. The church rose up to help those in need and to be the hands and feet of Jesus during this difficult time. We found out we are stronger together. As life returns to normal and things reopen, we'll never forget how important our relationships are and the value of spending time with loved ones in person. As we're able to gather again face to face, think of every person in your life at every age and every stage. They're waiting on an invitation to church from you. Because in every way that God connects us, we are stronger together now more than ever. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here uh, this morning on the main floor, uh, up on the balcony, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. Weren't those baptisms great? Yeah, that was exciting. And uh, I just want to let you know that we're going to do that again on the, uh, f the 15th of November. We've scheduled another baptism. So if you have not yet been baptized since you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I just want to encourage you to get a hold of one of us or one of the pastors, and we can plan uh, for that. These last three weeks, we've been uh, exploring the theme, Stronger Together. How many of you know we're stronger together? You know, there's great power in unity. When it ceases to be about me, mine, and it becomes about we, God can bless us in amazing ways. Because the Lord is attracted to unity. Did you know that? He's attracted to unity. How pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. When we're in unity, we experience incredible blessings. We are truly stronger together. So far in the series, we've explored the theme, Together We Find Peace, Together We Experience Love, and then last week, Pastor uh, talked about Together We Grow Stronger. Today, we're gonna be discussing a big idea. A, they're all big ideas, but this is a big idea. Together, we can impact the world. How many of you believe that? You know, certainly, our world is looking for hope and someone to bring solutions to the issues of our day. And uh, we live in a culture of superheroes. Many of you are probably aware that many, uh, probably about half or more of our biggest movies Multi-million dollar blockbuster type music mo movies are superhero movies. So let's take a moment and just reflect on that.
Anyone else? <laughs> I like that. Anyone else? It seems like many people uh, love superheroes, and I get it. They're fun. They're the embodiment of our imaginations. Who wouldn't like some kind of superpower to take out and just zap every once in a while for a solution? These superheroes in our imaginations, they fight for good, they defeat evil, they restore justice, they save the world, or do they? Actually, there's a serious problem. They're not reality. Even though they're so incredibly popular that millions and millions of people worldwide go to see them, they are not reality. Let me say this. The world will not be saved by a magical superhero created in someone's imagination. Sorry about that, all you superhero fans, but that's reality. Actually, let me say this. The world doesn't actually need any more superheroes. What the world needs is more everyday life heroes. People who will impact their world where they work, where they go to school, where they study, and in their neighborhoods where they live. Let's look at a clip of an everyday hero. Mr. Rogers. I'm here to interview you. This piece will be for an issue about heroes. Do you consider yourself a hero? We are trying to give the world positive ways of dealing with their feelings. Yeah? Like what? There are many things you can do. You can play all the lowest keys on a piano at the same time. Um, I've always felt that I didn't need to put on a funny hat or jump through the hoop to have a relationship with a child. And there must be times when you do feel blue. I'm not feeling blue right now, though. Me neither. <laughs> they didn't want black people to come and swim in their swimming pools. My being on the program was a statement for Fred. Love is at the root of everything. All learning, all relationships, love or the lack of it. I think the best thing we can do is to let people know um, that each one of them is precious. Well, Mr. Rogers, I'm sure it wasn't perfect. None of us are. He made a major impact in his world. And that's not because he had a television program or because he's recognized by millions, but because he saw value in every person he encountered and therefore he used his career to add value to them. He responded to letters from his fans. He stopped for photographs on the street. He spent time listening to children and adults who wanted to share a story with him, all because he knew the power of adding value to others. John Maxwell gives this quote and he says, we're often tempted to believe that our lasting impact will be our outputs. The things we do that are quantifiable, measurable, or easy to remember. But our genuine lasting impact will be the outcomes we leave behind. The people who were touched and transformed by what we did. Now Mr. Rogers left behind significant accomplishments for sure. He won all kinds of awards and everything like that. Accomplishments that could be measured. But what he's really remembered for is how his life impacted and changed the lives of people. Let me ask you this question. What will your lasting impact be? Have you thought about that? 
Will it be a list of achievements? Will it be a large bank account? A bunch of property? Some collector cars, perhaps? Nothing wrong with those things. But what will your lasting impact be? Will it be those achievements and those possessions? Or will it be a legacy of people who were impacted by your life? The best way to spend your life is to spend it on something that outlasts it. If you haven't discovered this yet, life goes very, very fast. What the world needs more of is everyday heroes like Mr. Rogers. And it's no coincidence that Mr. Rogers was a Christ follower. The principles he built his show on, the characteristics he lived out were Christ-like. Let me say the world needs more everyday heroes like Mr. Rogers because the world needs more of Jesus Christ. We can learn a lot from Mr. Rogers about creating space that welcomes people in, all people, to encourage them, to dream with them, to listen to them, and to walk with them. Changing the world doesn't require superheroes, it requires everyday heroes who make consistent choices to follow Christ daily and love people in practical ways by consistent, simple acts in his everyday life, Mr. Rogers impacted his world. In similar ways, we as individuals and all of us together, we can impact our world. We fulfill our purpose when we experience and live out God's love together and share it with those around us. The first half of the book of Ephesians Paul is dealing primarily with God's redemptive plan throughout history. He's dealing with God bringing humans together with himself. Then the second half of Ephesians, he turns the gospel story directly toward our lives and explores how the truth of the gospel should impact our life, how it should impact our story as we live it out personally, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, colleges, universities, and in our neighborhoods. See, every one of us is called to live a life of mission, regardless of what our occupation is. As a matter of fact, your career or your occupation, your family, your neighborhood, is the place you have actually been sent to on mission. Often, when we think about making a big impact in the world, we get hung up on all kinds of big acts, superhero kinds of things. We think for it to be real and meaningful, it has to be big and impressive. Too often, we fall into negative comparisons of our everyday life activities to someone else's single grandest accomplishment. I think we get too hung up on viewing changing the world as this big giant mission and it actually becomes overwhelming. However, if we each do our part where we are planted, then together, collectively together, we can impact our world. Now Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter four what type of an attitude we need to live with to do that. Ephesians chapter four, verse 32 says, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiving, living a life of love, following the example of Christ. That's what we're called to do. 
we're to follow the example of Christ. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, we read, the Son of Man did not come to be saved, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Philippians, the book that we covered this summer, we studied and looked at how Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Let me say this. You will not become an everyday hero who impacts the world if you're full of yourself. When was the last time that you emptied yourself for someone else's benefit? You see, servanthood requires a mental shift a change in your attitudes. Everyday heroes recognize that life is not all about them. The world does not evolve around them. See, making a lasting impact begins by shifting focus from self to others. True humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. This is what it means to lose your life. Forgetting yourself in service to others. When we stop focusing on all of our own needs and all of our own stuff, we suddenly become aware of the needs and opportunities to serve others around us. There's a very good chance that you have people in your life, in your world, in your sphere of influence today who would benefit greatly from the value that you could add to them. So be generous with your time, with your talents, with your resources, with your wisdom. Be willing to help someone who can't return the favor. Be available to listen to when someone wants to talk. And most of all, be intentional to add value to them in a way that will outlive the action itself and your own lifetime. Many of you are aware, my mom passed away this June on Father's Day. But the values, the things that she invested in our lives, in her family and in others, those values, that impact continues to live on. The reality is this, that powerful impact quite often is slow and steady. It comes through consistency over time. Like the water, when the water flows over those rocky mountains, it carves canyons in the mountains over much time. See, change in the world happens one person, one relationship at a time. So our choice is to be kind, to show compassion, to choose understanding over judgment, to give grace instead of anger, to choose service over position. These are world-changing actions. World-changing actions. We have many everyday heroes in Calvary Community Church who serve faithfully in the ministry here who serve faithfully in their families' lives, and who serve faithfully in the marketplace, bringing kingdom impact. And I just want to applaud all of the everyday heroes that are connected with this ministry here. Don't quit. Don't give up. And the church community gives us a place to find support, to find co-laborers, people with a common heart, cheerleaders who will support us and cheer us on in our steps to impact the world. Catch this. If we each are doing our part in the place where God has planted us, together we will impact the world. But we each need to do our part where we are planted. See, many of our culture's superheroes have superpowers or make-believe superpowers to help them with their mission to save the world. Of course, this is all fiction and not reality. But here is a reality. The Christian life is a supernatural life. See, everyday heroes have access to real supernatural power to fulfill their everyday mission. 
just before Paul writes to the Ephesians about marriage relationships, about family relationships, about work relationships, the places where we will spend most of our uh, awake hours, most of our life, Paul describes the need for supernatural power. In Ephesians 5, 18, Paul says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So why would Paul write to the Ephesians that they needed to be filled with the Spirit? Have you ever thought about that? They already were Christ followers. They had already received Jesus. I believe what Paul is doing, he is pointing out that there is a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There is one indwelling, but there needs to be many fillings. See, Paul draws a direct parallel between being drunk with wine in the scripture here and being filled with the Spirit. I believe Paul is highlighting the issue of influence or control. See, a person under the influence of wine will experience altered behavior. He or she may say or do things they would not ordinarily do. Emotions may, may be heightened for a brief period. Their mental processes will be affected and their decision-making ability will be radically altered and almost always to the negative effect, to the negative result. Likewise, the filling of the Holy Spirit produces a change in behavior. However, it always produces a change for the positive. In the book of Acts, we find that the, very, the once very ordinary, timid, and you might say incompetent disciples, when filled with the Holy Spirit, they became world changers. Their lives have made a lasting impact. You see, a spirit-filled life has a supernatural component. There's more to it than sitting and listening to a message and going through a, a religious ritual. It has a supernatural component. There's power, power in a spirit-filled life. There is the power of supernatural resourcefulness. See, the power of the Holy Spirit gives us power beyond our natural resources, beyond our natural abilities and talents. Things will happen in and through our lives that obviously are not us. And you know, when that happens, God gets the glory, doesn't he? And then there's the supernatural power of resiliency. And oh my, how we need that today in our world. The power to bounce back under extreme pressure. The power to handle stress and persecution. The power to walk through tremendous life challenges. The power to overcome in spiritual warfare. And by the way, we're gonna spend six weeks in Ephesians 6 after Thanksgiving. This is something that is incredibly important in the world that we're going into in this next stage of history. We're gonna be able, we're gonna to need to do spiritual warfare at another level than we ever have. The supernatural power of resiliency. And then there's the supernatural power of a transformed life. The number one role of Holy Spirit in our lives is to conform us to the image of Jesus. We should be looking more like Jesus than we did last week or last year. He's changing us. It's a work of continuous character development. It's a work of developing the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Supernatural power of the fruit of the Spirit. And then there's the supernatural power of a missional life. Jesus met with his disciples, his close followers, 
before his ascension and he gave him this instruction in Acts chapter one, verse eight. He said, ask them to go to Jerusalem. And then what, what he said, but you will receive power, dudamus, dynamite, dynamo type power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right in your own home context. And then in all Judea and Samaria, the neighboring places, your neighbors, and then to the ends of the earth. You know, your acts of kindness, your act of service this week to someone that smile or that encouragement to the cashier, perhaps. Perhaps you are a link. You could well be part of a link in somebody's journey to Christ. You are sent into your world to serve in your mission. See, fulfilling the mission that you were made for will require you to abandon your agenda. We need to throw away our agenda. And we need to adjust to God's agenda. David prayed, turn me away from wanting any other plan than yours. Let me suggest in your morning prayer time, instead of praying, God bless what I want to do today, we could be praying, God fill me with your supernatural Holy Spirit power so I can live out my life mission today, so I can join you in what you want to do today. See, if you want your life to make a lasting impact, Paul says, don't be drunk with wine because that's gonna ruin your life. Instead, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit is a command. In the Greek language, this verb is in the imperative mode. That means the filling of the Spirit isn't an optional part of the Christian life, like something we can just kind of decide we're gonna do, not gonna, we might, we might not. It's not an option. Every Christian is to be filled with the Spirit all of the time. The time we are not filled with the Spirit, we are out of the will of God. Secondly, we see be filled with the Spirit is in the present tense in the Greek. And in the Greek, the present tense is the idea of a continual action. We legitimately could translate this verse this way. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. You might say, well, why do we have to be filled continually? Isn't once enough? Well, let me suggest that we are weak human vessels and we leak. We leak by disobedience, by willful sin, by pride, putting ourselves back in charge of our life, lack of faith. So we need to continually be filled with the Spirit to be brought into alignment with what God is doing on the earth today. And then we see it is in the passive voice. Be filled with the Spirit is in the passive voice. In Greek, as in in English, commands can either be active or passive. Example of an act of command is go to the store and pick up some milk, please. But Ephesians 5.18 is in the passive voice. He doesn't say fill yourself with the Spirit, but rather he says be filled with the Spirit. It's kind of like saying to someone, be loved. Well, how do you do that? Suppose I say to you, be loved. If there isn't someone who wants to love you, you can't obey that command. Likewise, if there isn't someone who wants to fill you, you can't be filled with the Spirit. He's not saying fill yourself, but he's saying rather be filled. And I want you to catch this. This is really, really important. Holy Spirit is ready and willing to fill us. But this is not something we can do ourselves. It is the, clearly the divine work of Holy Spirit. However, we must make ourselves available to fill. 
Let me give you a new word. Somebody made up all the words we already use, right? Would, would that be right? Let me make up a word today. Is that okay? How about the word fillability? Fillability. It's kind of like if you went to a gas station, and there still are a few where there's a service station attendant there, and you pull up and you say, fill her up. Fill her up. The person pumping the gas knows the statement. He knows what that means. That means you're on empty or, or you're on half, and you want your tank filled up. Here's the reality. Some Christ followers, Christians, are so full of themselves. We're so full of ourselves that there's no room for the Holy Spirit. We're so full of our religion that there's no room for the Holy Spirit. We're so full of our traditions that there's no room for the Holy Spirit. And some of us have just simply closed our heart to the work of the Holy Spirit. And it could well be because of fear or some other misunderstandings of Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit, we need two things, emptiness and openness. There must be a great sense of need. Even as we prayed this morning several times, God, we need you. Lord, I'm empty. I need your spirit to fill me. And there has to be a willingness. Lord, I am open to you. Let your spirit fill me now. He said, when your need to be filled with the Spirit becomes your great desire, you will be filled over and over again. To be filled, we have to deal with this big issue. And this big issue is control, control. The need to be in control. To be filled, we need to surrender control to the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this question. Are you willing? Are you willing to surrender control of your life to the Holy Spirit? Let's go back to the contrast between wine and the Spirit. See, drunken and Spirit-filled people have one thing in common. They are both controlled people. Their lives and their behavior are radically changed and controlled by that which fills them. When the Holy Spirit fills you, he will have the controlling interest in your life. Now it's by consent. Control by consent. Holy Spirit is gentle and gracious, but God is ready and willing and able to fill you right now. As a matter of fact, he's more willing to fill you than you are willing to be filled. He's ready to fill you. I mentioned one indwelling, many fillings. There may be some of us here this morning, or maybe some watching online today, you would say, I don't even know if Jesus dwells in my life. I don't know if I've invited him into my life, or you know you haven't. This morning is the opportunity to invite him into your life. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer in a moment, and I'm gonna invite you all to join me in this prayer. And in this prayer, we're going to acknowledge Jesus and we're gonna invite him to come and dwell in our life and to be our Lord and Savior. Let's pray together, and if you can join me, those of you online, whether in your family room or wherever you're watching this this morning, I invite you to join me in this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for raising from the dead on the third day. Lord Jesus, today I receive your gift, your free gift of salvation, and I invite you to come into my life. I invite you to come into my life and to be my savior. Today I surrender 
I surrender my life to you, and I'm going to follow you. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, there's a number coming up on the screen. Uh, I want to encourage you to take out your cell phone and text LIFE to 587-323-1199. What's going to happen, there's going to be a screen that's going to come up. We'll just give us your contact information and we're, we're going to send to you a uh, online resource called Next Steps, which is going to help you in your new decision to follow Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or if you need assistance, don't hesitate to contact the church office. You can find more information on our website, and as always, you can join us live on Sundays at 10 a.m. on our Facebook and YouTube page or at calvarycommunity.ca live. We'll see you next week.